Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hal Shirtliff. I am the Colonial Coordinator for the Garbage Society. I'll be your MC for this uh, for the Greater Boston Business and Professional Chapter of the Garbage Society. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker. Before I do that, I want to give a little background. And uh, when he finishes, he's going to introduce a colleague of, of his, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Greg Hessian, who is an attorney and a, a longtime JBS member. But um, Dr. Homia Mertula, I got it right. Kishore, um, he uh, he was uh, coming to a couple of our meetings down in the South Shore, <coughs> business show we were having, of the movie uh, America, Imagine World Without Her. And he said to me, I have a story to tell as well. And I said, well, i got to follow up on this guy. He said, he's coming all the way from Chestnut Hill to, to Weymouth. He must be in business. And he got a hold of me, said he wanted to become a member of the Burger Society. And I said, well, we'd love to do that. He's actually had a friend of his that joined. And he told me a story. I said, well, I think you should tell your story at this luncheon. Then I called Greg, an, an unrelated uh, matter, and I said, Greg, do you happen to know a guy named uh, Dr. Kishore? And he said, yeah, I'm doing a, st a story about him in the New American Magazine. I said, what a small world. So uh, I'm going to let the doc tell the story here. I'm just going to give a quick introduction. Uh, Massachusetts physician from 1977 to current. Educated at Harvard School of Public Health. We won't hold that against you, by the way. <laughs> Trained in community-oriented uh, primary care. Board qualified in preventive medicine, board certified in addictive medicine, and he's probably, if not one of the, the first uh, addictologist, is what you said, probably the first one in the world, um, fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine, honored by the Boston Celtics as Heroes Among Us, founded Massachusetts model of addictive care. So let's give a nice warm hand to uh, Dr. Kishore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I think it's a great opportunity for me to tell my story and uh, ask you a question. Um, I start with the last slide. I brought in 15 slides, and this is the very last one. Is this American justice? I'm going to have uh, Greg, who's been writing my story, tell most of it, the bulk of it. Um, but it's a fascinating story of my journey into medicine, the, medicine, the business of medicine, and um, the glass ceiling I hit, and what happened subsequently, how my company was taken down. And um, here I am um, to tell the story of uh, how I survived this uh, four years of, uh, as Greg calls it, colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it's been a long journey for me to stand here, hold my head up, and tell my story. And <clears throat> the take-home points are, is this American justice? Is this how we should treat an enterprise? We, how, how do you treat innovation? How do you promote it, not uh, bring it down? And especially, all of you heard about the OxyContin epidemic, heroin epidemic, overdose deaths. We have a problem in the society. And where do the answers come from? We need medical leadership. We need leadership uh, in many areas of human endeavor. And we have to group together to make it happen. So my story tells you a little bit about a microcosm of what's happening here and now in this state. And uh, it's a fascinating story. I'm going to have Greg uh, start off. Uh, with his section of the story, and then I'll come back to give you some um, fill in the gaps. Oh. Yeah, go to. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Gregory Hessian. I am a, have been a lawyer for about 20 years <clears throat> in Massachusetts. 
suffering currently from uh, a little bit of, of my own takedown, and I'll tell you about that after a bit. Dr. Kishore, Dr. Kishore has had an experience that not just would make a movie, would probably make two movies. We're going to tell you a little bit about it, and I think it'll be uh, worth your while and an interesting uh, finish to the dinner rather than uh, sometimes uh, a, a snore that happens with speakers after dinner. You're going you're to find some, some uh, uh, sparkling things and some very discouraging ones. Dr. Kishore is to de-addiction medicine as McDonald's is to hamburgers. And <clears throat> he has figured out something he called this Massachusetts model, a way to systematize helping people, a lot of the people that we don't probably in this room see too many of. And I'm going to introduce you to the seamy underbelly of what's going on all around us in our cities and towns here. And Dr. Kishore got involved in the drug war. He got involved as a non-combatant. And as with most non-combatants, the Red Cross or whatever, they just try to keep from getting shot while everybody else is having the war. He got taken down as well in the war. And I'm going to tell you how that happened. In September of 2011, Dr. Kishore right here. Now, how many police do you think it would take to uh, take him into custody? Well, about four or five. <laughs> <laughs> Heavily armed. <laughs> well, th that's, you're, you're way under. Um, 15 police cars, 30 state troopers, and a helicopter. And they all came to get this fierce looking man here and take him into custody. Why? I'm going to tell you a little bit about this story. This really was the, uh, there's a couple people behind the scenes that were operating what happened to Dr. Kishore. One is the um, unlamentedly erstwhile Attorney General Martha Coakley. Now, you may remember her, and, uh, <laughs> and the other one is a name which is far less known, a guy named Michael Botticelli. Michael Botticelli was the head of the Massachusetts Bureau of Drug or Substance Abuse. Now, isn't that an interesting name for a, uh, for a Massachusetts uh, bureaucracy? That bureaucracy gets about $75 million a year of our tax money, and... Uh, Here's the problem with government agencies, and this is one that will illustrate the, the, the point perfectly. The whole point of these agencies is you can't succeed or the agency won't have a purpose. So the purpose of the Bureau of, of Substance Abuse is to make sure that substance abuse continues unabated. In fact, it would be even better if it would increase because even more bureaucrats could be employed and the budget will get bigger and bigger. For example, this year it's 8% more than it was last year. And if you've noticed, I don't know if you've been watching this, but the governor and the new attorney general are convening all kinds of blue ribbon commissions and other completely ineffective uh, 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 sorts of uh, blue ribbon commissions and everything to study the drug abuse problem in the Commonwealth. Something happened after Dr. Kishore was taken out of this um, field, and that is drug usage and abuse shot up like that. If you look at the statistics, it went along, 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 and suddenly he was taken out of the field. And So let me tell you what he did a little bit. Dr. Kishore began uh, working in a an addiction program that was literally founded at the time of the founders. Dr. Benjamin Rush, Martha Washington were involved with this, and he learned, he began to cut his teeth there and learn about the addiction issues. And he became uh, involved with that and said, that's the niche he's going to, uh, going to pursue. So he did. And as time went on, he had the opportunity to become a director there, and he moved on to other positions where he learned his trade. Over time, he began to develop a systematic approach 
to dealing with drug abuse, something that nobody had ever done before. Here's how you deal with drug abuse, and it's the same way that most physicians at this point seem to deal with a lot of things. Here, go take a drug. Okay? Here's how you deal with drug abuse. Go to the methadone clinic, go to the suboxone clinic, get your narcotics there instead of here. Instead of on the corner, we'll addict you to this other narcotic. Now, I don't know if, if, if a lot of us haven't had the opportunity maybe to, uh, to see that, that world that's around us, that sort of invisible world, but it's, it's not a nice world. And there's a, there's, a, there's a street ecology, you could call it. Doc, that's the term that Dr. Kishore uses. And the street ecology consists of runners, of dealers, of money people, of mules, all kinds of people that do the things that need to be done to make sure that the drug economy works. When you pull a person out of that, something happens. Those people don't want their buddy pulled out of it. They pull him back and they try to pull him back. So in addition to all the psychological and physical forces that keep a person pulled into drug addiction, it's also that street ecology that keeps the hold on that person. So Dr. Kishore knew he had to deal with a much bigger um, concept than just treating the drug addiction. So the easy way to do this, think about this. If you go get your methadone, there's nothing that says you, you can't continue to be a drug dealer and continue to take the other drugs too. It's just another high. A lot of people do. And I happened to be uh, talking to um, a, a business owner right next to the gigantic methadone clinic in Springfield, uh, near, near where I live. And the guy says there's needles all everywhere. He goes, every, time he, every day he goes out there and just, it's just full of all kinds of needles and drug paraphernalia and everything, right next door to the clinic. So obviously the people are not using the methadone only. They're continuing their other addictions. So Dr. Kishore came up with, with some very important concepts. First of all, when, when an addict is trying to get rid of an addiction, there's some immediate physical symptoms for the first period of time. And that, those symptoms have to be dealt with. Uh, so he gives non-narcotic uh, medications to help them with the aches, the nausea, the sleeplessness, and all kinds of other things that occur over this first month. Now, once that happens, you also need to do other things like keeping them out of that street ecology. You need to be able to help them with uh, other medical problems. So he views his practice as a primary care practice that focuses on addiction. But think about all the other problems that a person who's drug addicted often would have as medical issues. Sexually transmitted diseases, hepatitis, all, all kinds of other problems, nutritional uh, problems uh, and the results of bad nutrition. So all of these things can be treated in a holistic way as a person. Now, Here's what Dr. Kishore was able to do. Anybody know what the long-term sobriety rate for Alcoholics Anonymous is? Generally 2 to 5 percent of one year sobriety rate. The, when Dr. Kishore started, he, he started at about 37 percent. When they took him down with the uh, snipers and all those guys, he was up to almost 60 percent long-term sobriety rate. So clearly he was putting the hurt on the people that profited from the drug dealing business, namely the government. <clears throat> now, instead of doing that, they should have given him a medal. But I'm going to tell you what happened. You're only through the, the first movie. Now, wait, the, the, the sequel's better. <laughs> um, so, so, our, so Mr. Botticelli, the, uh, the drug czar from Massachusetts, who was just maybe two weeks ago um, coronated as the United States drug czar. So the Peter Principle <laughs> is always at work. Everybody always gets appointed to their level of incompetence and in his case, above it. So now he can do to the country what he did to Massachusetts and impose that defective, ineffective methodology of dealing with drugs. Now, it's a, it's a tragedy and a shame 
that people get so pulled into all this. But what happens, particularly these opium-based types of compounds, the reason they work is they slow your body down. They stop everything from going right, like digestion and everything else. So it causes, it racks terrible um, offense on, on one's body. And you, you know, a long-term opium type addiction, that is, you know, with um, Vicodin, Oxycontin, heroin, all of these are all these, these uh, opium-based narcotics. Some are synthetic and some, are, some come from a, a, a poppy plants. You, you rack up your body. So there's a lot that needed to be done. So Dr. Kishore, not only did he put together this program, but he decided, well, we need to go to the places where these addicts are if we're going to have a primary care practice. So he began to put um, freestanding practices all over the Commonwealth, and he had maybe 25 or so, and he began to put them in what they call sober houses. Now, a lot of us here might not know what a sober house is. I didn't. A sober house is sort of a halfway house where addicts are trying to get the counseling and treatment they need to get back into society and kick the habit and stay on the straight and narrow. You're not allowed to stay in one if they drug test you and, you've, and, and your, um, your drug tests show that you've been using. So there's a lot of profit in these sober houses. Um, sober houses are generally funded in large measure by both government and by rentals of the people that stay there. One of the keys to a sober house is the drug testing, which uh, medically is recommended about three times a week. Dr. Kishore, as part of his treatment plan for people, recommended testing three times a week as a stick to make sure that they stayed also on the straight and narrow. But a sober house, unless they have a primary care practice located there, can't prescribe drug testing. Well, what was happening in the Commonwealth prior to Martha Coakley doing this is the drug testing people were just simply getting these testings done and they were illegally charging them to Medicaid or getting falsified doctor signatures on these things. Medicaid will only reimburse a, a drug test if it's done by a doctor's prescription. <coughs> So Dr. Kishore got the idea, and it's a sensible one both in terms of a business and, of course, in terms of helping the people, locate the primary practice in these sober houses. That way, we can do patient intakes, we can find out what the problems are, we can provide the necessary testing and the necessary medical care for these people. And it worked out well, and he had 20-some of those also. So when he, when he was finally taken out, there were over 50 practices around the Commonwealth that were providing medical services for these unfortunate people. His total lifetime, he calculated maybe 250,000 people his practices have treated. Can you imagine that? That's a lot in a small state. And it's only been in Massachusetts. So, you know, a state of six million people, that's a large percentage of the population that have seen Dr. Kishore. So here's what happened. When he began to put these things in the sober houses, it started to impinge on the business of some of these other labs. There were many commercial testing labs that didn't operate as primary testing practices. They were just laboratory drug testing businesses, and big ones, some of them nationwide and some of them centered in the Commonwealth. The money that these guys made was pretty phenomenal. And the uh, Boston Globe published a chart that showed that two of the biggest ones were going like this, down, 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 as Dr. Kishore's was going up. Martha Coakley, at the same time, needed a, a good campaign issue to wave around. <clears throat> and a good thing to do was to you know, pick on these, the Medicaid fraud situation. So that, that, that came across as, a, came across, we're, you know, we're doing something for the people here. So, she began to ally with some of the uh, a little less than savory characters to take down some of these labs. So one fella who they worked with is a guy named David Perry. Now, David Perry is a disbarred lawyer, was a disbarred lawyer. He was disbarred for 10 years, a felon, a drug dealer, and a, a, a drug user himself. This is all public information. 
that I read in the newspaper. And um, he had a sober house himself, a place called Safe Haven. It was in Boston, and it was uh, not sober, and it wasn't safe. And there were so many cops called there so many times that the city council finally convened and took him out. They, they shut him down because there was, so many, uh, there was so much drug dealing going on there, it became a, a difficulty for the neighborhood. So all of the sober houses don't always uh, work, work to be sober. So after that got gone, the two fellows, a guy named David Fromm, who was a partner with Mr. Perry, they each went separate ways, but pretty allied. Fromm went and fo founded another commercial drug testing lab, and Perry founded another sober house. Now, Fromm decided he was going to take out all of his competition, and he began to sue them. Sue, 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 and there's still a ton of lawsuits out there. I've done a search of the, uh, uh, of the uh, dockets, and I'm finding that the guy sued practically every competitor he's had. And Mr. Perry was used by the Attorney General as a takedown guy. So he went, he, he actually was sort of the, the guy that they used for a sting, we could put it that way. He took out Callaway Laboratories, he took out Willow Laboratories, and then it was time to go to Dr. Kishore. Now, it was pretty easy to get those guys because they were bribing people at sober houses to get their business. Callaway paid a $20 million fine for doing that to the Attorney General. So that was a nice little thing she could wave around and say, wow, this is, you know, we're, we're doing justice for the people. But Dr. Kishore, they figured they were going to get him now. And in 2009, in December, the Attorney General, an investigator for the Attorney General, with the Attorney General's explicit orders, went to David Perry's sober house and set up a sting. One-way mirror, recordings, three dummy employees kind of ming um, lingering around, and the investigator was there too. So they were going to see if he would offer a bribe. So Dr. Kishore and several of his top people went over there to talk with him about setting up a sober house in Mr. Perry's, uh, setting up a primary care practice in Mr. Perry's sober house. The problem is, is he wouldn't bribe them. It just foiled their whole plan. It was terrible. So they left without what they wanted. That, of course, would have resulted in a much earlier, uh, a, a much earlier uh, raid on his house. So, but that didn't work. So what did they do next? Well, they sent in the Department of Robbery, I mean Revenue, <laughs> They sent in the Drug Enforcement Administration. That didn't work because he didn't use narcotics. He didn't, he didn't prescribe narcotics to cure narcotics. So they didn't have any narcotics to, uh, to get him on. So they sent, the Attorney General sent in uh, their crack um, Medicaid fraud division. They spent 13 months going over everything and found nothing. The Office of Inspector General went there. So as you can see, this isn't random. All right? the, when, you, when they want you, they get you. So, in 2009, because nothing else worked, they then decided to convene a grand jury. The grand jury meandered around for two years. And in the interim, they, they, they used some other really shady tactics involving a bunch of lawyers. Isn't that surprising? <laughs> shady lawyers? <clears throat> The first, the first lawyer that was involved with this is a guy named Sorrell. Now, you may don't, maybe don't know that name. He appeared in the news in hundreds of articles, and you may not have noticed his name. But a lot of us have heard of the New England Compounding Center. He's the lawyer. He's the lawyer that got him to back off in about the mid-2000s before they'd killed all these people. He, he said, no, we're safe, everything's fine, don't worry, nothing to see here. And then that's when all of the, that's when everything happened. So Sorrell, um, some have called him a fixer. Right? He's, he's the kind of a guy that you, you hire to do it, like a sort of a James Carville kind of a guy, you know, a, a fixer. All right, so Sorrell deals with this, like these medical types of uh, practices, and that's his specialty. 
Um, so Sorrell wanted to get <clears throat> a monitoring contract that would allow his firm um, in the high rent district in Boston to get about a, 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 a million and a quarter a year to monitor the evil Dr. Kishore to make sure that he complied. So behind the scenes, this was all contrived, and Sorrell delivered the, the message. Dr. Kishore said, no, thank you. Now, this is the way it's done, by the way, folks. This is the way it's done. The government, the business, the ally, the money's there, and everybody makes plenty of money. All right, that didn't work. So <clears throat> he hired a, a, a lawyer, another very connected lawyer, uh, from Libyan Hoops, a big um, white-collar defense firm. Um, the attorney general met with his lawyer and delivered another message. You've got to give up your law license and your practice, and um, everything will go fine with you. He, again, refused. He hired another lawyer. This guy was even more connected. His name is Stern, U former U.S. attorney. Some of you may know who he is. He delivered the same message. Dr. Kishore again said, no. So when you refuse an offer you can't refuse, they're not, they, they don't take no for an answer sometimes. And, and after that, um, they sort of put the horse head in his bed, and as, as the movie uh, goes. So that's, um, and then the, the takedown that we talked about at the very beginning resulted. Now, Dr. Kishore, after, um, in, in this uh, 2011 time frame, this, um, in September of 2011, after, after they arrested him, the day after they arrested him, they came back with 32 indictments for Medicaid fraud. And then after two more years, now get this, a grand jury for four years is looking at this. They came back with 44 more indictments in the year 2013, a separate case. And what, what they were saying is, is that he was bribing these sober houses to get their business. Now, the interesting thing about this, a lot of you, almost all of us have gone into a convenience store and we'll see a, uh, Dunkin' Donuts in there, we'll see a, uh, a subway in there. That's called co-location. You ever go to the airport, you're going to see all these various franchises there. Co-locations. They rent space from the airport. Dr. Kishore used that same tactic. He did a co-location. He rented space in the sober house for his medical practice. And he, did, he had a lawyer, paid him to do a contract. He paid them rent every month. All of these various sober houses. And the attorney general, interestingly enough, admitted to the court, I've been able to see this paper, uh, well, it doesn't look like a, 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 a scheme, but it's a scheme. <laughs> I mean, it, they literally admit it, that it's a scheme on paper only. But we know he was a bad guy. So um, they really have, uh, they've said, it looks bad, so we're going to take him out because, well, we never really do know the because yet. We'll find out. He has a trial scheduled for April uh, on these first 32 indictments. Now, that's somewhat uh, fearsome. And this has been going on now for four years. Can you imagine having this hang over your head for four years? Actually, for six, in a way, because it started in 2009. And uh, the others, uh, the other 44, it's unclear exactly what's going to be happening there. I had an opportunity to attend a couple of these hearings and watch what was happening. The Attorney General has three people there prosecuting this guy. And uh, so they really want him. They want him bad. And uh, he has a very large Boston law firm that's going to be assisting him at the trial. And uh, we'll find out what happens. But uh, <clears throat> thank goodness we have juries. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, now, there's a few lessons that I think have come home to me as I put this material together to do an article for the New American Magazine, which I hope you subscribe to. If you don't, it's great. Um, try to get it if you can. There seems to be a difference between 
um, government employees who are what uh, our local columnist Howie Carr would call a hack and a true believer. And I, you can almost spot the way that, that they're different. I view uh, Martha Coakley as a hack. She just is somebody that wanted to keep the job and keep the power. Whereas I view as Elizabeth Warren as a true believer. I think she believes her Marxist ideas. No, I really do. I think, she's, I think she really believes that Marxism is the way to go, probably more than Marx believed it. You know? <laughs> and, and so what, what you're fighting in a situation like that is not somebody that's ideological, but somebody who, who just wants a scalp. And now that there's a different attorney general, we'll see if that same thing happens. <laughs> Um, I'd also, while I'm thinking of it, would like to recommend to you uh, a, an, an author took a great deal of time to write a whole series up to, I think, seven or eight articles at this point for uh, Chalcedon Foundation on Dr. Kishore uh, method that he used to uh, treat addiction and on some of these things in much, much more detail because it probably comprises over 100 pages at this point if you really have some interest in the whole thing. Chalcedon um, is named after one of the early um, conferences of all of the bishops in the world that occurred in the first several hundred years of the, uh, of the Christian church. And Chalcedon is spelled C-H-A-L-E-D-O-N. And it's chalcedon.org, if I'm not mistaken. And the, the, the author is named Martin Selbrede, S-E-L-B-R. E D E Martin Selbrady, if anybody would like to check it out more. So, um, some of the interesting things that, that really lead you to, to scratch your head on this. For example, the largest sober house that he's accused of bribing did not get indicted at all. Three of the tiny little ones he's accused of bribing did. Why? Well, you got to look and see who runs the large one. And once you look and see who runs the large one, then you know. And that's the way it works. So um, a number of these sort of anomalies are there. And uh, the, 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 real, the real takeaway of all this is what is happening to our politics? What is happening to even... A, a man who went into business to help people. He had a business, and he helped people with his business. I bet a lot of you do the same, right? A lot of you are in business, and a lot of you help people in your business. And doesn't it, it scares me to think that if you happen to be in a category that the government doesn't like at that point, you may be one that they decide to come after. I can assure you that Dr. Kishore did not think he was in the crosshairs when this, when this started. He didn't think that at all. He was providing a service. He was, he was um, at the top of his game. He was doing uh, medical work for people that desperately needed it. And Martha Coakley was absolutely not on the radar. I wonder if there's any of the other of us in this room that are on the radar. That's what scares me. Um, I've had the same problem. Um, I was on the radar and didn't know it. I decided to sue the Chief Justice of the Commonwealth. That was not a good career move. Um, shortly thereafter, on a complete, for a completely different reason, uh, things came unglued, and I've uh, been without a law license for a year and a half. Hopefully, I'm going to have it back within a month or so. Um, they move very, very slowly. Um, but the, uh, I think we all have to really consider, <coughs> particularly our involvement with a group like the John Birch Society, helps us, I think, take the much bigger picture of these sorts of things. 
It has for me. I never would have understand this sort of things if I hadn't been a regular reader of the New American Magazine to see the underlying political issues that really come up in these sorts of things. So we should always be thinking, all right, is what I'm doing one of those things? Homeschool. Homeschool is one of those things that, that pulls, pulls attention from authorities. Um, having particular religious beliefs sometimes pulls attention from authorities. Having certain political opinions pulls attention from authorities. Having opinions about taxation can sometimes get the authorities very interested. So we got to just be careful about what we do. And one of the things that I learned from my own experience is never do something that could even ever be construed to be illegal. You always have to fight on the bright side of the road. Uh, we got to change things and we got to change things legitimately by educating people through programs such as this and, and our neighbors and whatnot. And you can never, if you cross the line, uh, purposely or inadvertently, that's going to be not the way to fight it. So uh, I, I urge us to continue to you know, become more aware of what's really going on behind the scenes in the government. I think Dr. Kishore's lesson is, is helpful to all of us to, to see the, 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 the structure of how government is working with businesses, how government is working against our own interests. And I'd urge all of us to just make sure that, that we're looking at our own lives and, 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 and shore up anything that may not, uh, may not be the r right there. Um, and so that is uh, all I had for today. And I think Dr. Kishore had a few other words uh, to wind up with. <clears throat> there you go. Thank you. I call Greg my American voice. <clears throat> and he's done a, we spent um, three months together cloistered on his farm while he was taking care of the the pigs and whatever in between, we would talk and look at the documents. And he made a great summary of my story. It's a complex story. It's not something that's easy to understand. He made it understandable, readable, and intrigued the public. <clears throat> um, so it's dramatically started with that arrest with uh, 33 squad cars coming to my house and guns. 9-11. And at uh, 3 p.m., my lawyers were talking to the AG's office trying to see if we can calm it down a bit. And six hours later, they were at my house, pre-planned. Co-location, co-employment. We located practices like uh, Greg was talking about, like Subway does, Dunkin' Donuts does, to make it happen, make the consumers easy to access care, and that's the charge. The boards of medicine pharmacy are used in a heavy way. I sent four people, four young ladies who were drunk in a sober house to get care at a hospital. That's a 2006. August 4th, it happened. So right after this, they dusted it off. You violated the civil liberties of these four women who were drunk. You should not send them, you should let them sleep. Doesn't make any common sense, but that's the charge. Trying to take my license. One medical record, they sequestered within their own confines. They wanted to use that. The precision company they use that GPS for 1,500 days. I had a GPS. It's, it's radiation on my leg. Recently, I had kidney surgery, which they were trying to see if it's cancer. We can see GPS to the. Um, it's the same radiation as a cell phone. We know cell phones cause brain cancer. It's the same thing that happens when you have GPS on your leg for so long. 
my emails were stolen. All my correspondence with the legal team, they are read. Driver's license vehicles are important. They were attacked. I had a, my admirers set up a great Wikipedia page that was taken down before they took me out. Mass health is 18%, 20% of my money. They held the monies four months in advance, not telling me why they did that. Fake news, fake gag orders, cyberbullying, a lot of characters here. Too, too long for the, for the luncheon here. It's, it's, a, it's a book in itself. This is my company. I had 370 employees, 52 offices. We're serving 214 insurance companies. We were growing at the rate of 100, 112% a year. Uh, it was a nationally recognized model. It's called the Massachusetts model. There are four models of addiction care in the, in, in the world. One is called the Minnesota model, which is 28 days in a rehab. Petty Ford Center, Hazelden, they exemplify that. Then you have the Florida model where you live in a hotel or a motel, then you go and get care at the doctor's office next door. That's called the Florida model. Minnesota, Minnesota model is $1,000 a day. So it's about $30,000 for a month's care. People can't afford it, except for the very rich. Nobody can give money to get care. Florida model is cheaper, $10,000 a month, but you live in a hotel or a motel, and then you go for care. Then you have the Pennsylvania model, which is what uh, our state believes in, we're replacing one drug with the other. That's called the Pennsylvania model. And then you have my model, the Massachusetts model, where we treat lifelong as a primary care patient, making sure that they don't relapse or slip or slide. So it was recognized as a national and international model. We're seeing close to 700 new patients a month. This is a, the money growth. I didn't believe in debt. I started by hard work in 1991. November 1st, I started my practice. It was slow going at first. I got to find out all the ins and outs of my practice. But by 2001, two, I began to hit traction. <clears throat> Insurance companies realized it's much cheaper to treat addiction outpatient than inpatient. Number two, consumers are happy. They don't have to go to a, a psychiatric center. They can come to a primary care and not be called a mentally ill person. Addiction is considered a mental illness in medicine. I didn't treat it like that. I treated it as a cough, cold, or a, so <clears throat> people liked it. So we were in an upward trajectory with the money. We were uh, doing very well. <clears throat> So we combined five elements, primary care, home detox, detoxing in their own homes, people like that. Sobriety maintenance, not taking, rolling up my sleeves and say, okay, the buck stops with me, I'll take care of the person's relapse. So maintaining sobriety by drug testing, by surveillance. Sobriety enhancement, making them like their sober life. And then creating treatment on demand. They wanted help, they came for help. So, we have, Greg has essentially mentioned many of these. We have an epidemic right now. It's costing us a lot of money. State has a budget of $34 billion. $11 billion are going for Medicaid, which is essentially treating the addicts and poor people. But most of them are on addictive medicines. So it's a huge industry um, providing medical services for the addicted. But this taxpayer dollars at work. It can easily be resurrected. There is a great need to resurrect the model back because there's no other working model. Drug replacement is not working. Uh, putting them away in jails is not working. Putting them into faraway little islands is not working. 
So we got to treat them where they are, as Greg calls it, they're ecologically friendly. We got to treat them in their own communities. And it's a story and a half here. Without family, faith, well wishes, organizations like JBS, understanding the rules of the game, which Greg did a human job explaining to you how the game works, and finding unfettered present media, without which nobody, you can't tell your story. Chalcedon has done a great job, so is uh, the New American. The stories are coming out, but not in the Boston Globe or <laughs> local press. It's a story and a half, but it's been totally ignored after the takedown. Without this, I would not have survived. I would not be standing here to tell the story. And I thank JBS for giving me the opportunity to say what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Well, <clears throat> I want to and by the way, we're taping this. It's going to be on cable on YouTube. And once it's available on YouTube, um, I'll email you copies of this, which you hopefully will get out to your people in your circles on other social media networks. I know the maybe the Boston Broadside would like to do a little story about this. And maybe you know some other, uh, a lot of bloggers out there, a lot of, you know, lots of alternative media can really get this story out there and be a big help. So uh, with that, I want to thank you all for uh, attending. If you're not on, if you don't have, uh, well, if you'd like to be uh, informed of our monthly meetings uh, and we don't have your email, please give that to me. <coughs> our next, mo next month's meeting will be the last Friday of March. I bet you some of the snow would be melted by that. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> Maybe be able to see that thing called the ground, right? Uh, and our guest speaker there will be this guy, Greg Hessian. He'll be talking about the parental rights amendment issue and how dangerous that is. Uh, well, there's no such thing. What's that? Parental rights. Parental rights, rights. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway. It takes uh, a village. So I want to thank you all for coming, and God bless you. OK, so. Excuse me. Is that one? No, sure.